Here is what you missed this morning on the Catholic Morning Show. We go to our next guest, Steve Ray. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Deacon, and thanks for being a deacon and serving the church. Yeah, you you uh, you are always so kind to uh, express your gratitude, and uh, I always want to remain grateful for the privilege that it is to, to serve the church in, in such a role. Um, but you serve the church in such a great role as well as your witness as a Catholic convert to the faith. And today we're going to talk about uh, our Blessed Mother, as we've been doing uh, throughout the month of May. And, and talk real quick from your perspective: how was it? Uh, how difficult was was the, the doctrines and dogmas of Mary a, a challenge to your uh, conversion to the Catholic faith? Well, uh, in one way it was a big challenge, and then it became no challenge at all. So, But the first part is, is for evangelical Protestants and their conversion, Mary is usually a pretty big issue because she's not mentioned so much in the Bible. She's not uh, there on every page like her son is. And we always said that people made way too much of a deal about Mary, and that detracted from giving glory to her son. And therefore, it was always kind of a big issue that uh, Mary was brought up with. So we, we always thought that, jokingly said, that Catholics made Mary the fourth person of the Trinity. Uh, which obviously is ridiculous, but that's we jokingly said that. But the reality is, is that once I came to understand the issues of authority, then all of the other issues fell into place. So as though, and, and by the way, let me say this also, I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament than I did from the New Testament, because the Old Testament is full of images of Mary, typology, and what, what we call typology or prefigurations, like the Ark of the Covenant, the Daughter of Zion, these kind of things, and even the burning bush are all pictures of Mary, so that when we finally get to the point in history where Mary appears, you're supposed to be able to look back at the Old Testament and say, oh, of course, there she is, there she is, there she is, and she's the fulfillment of all of this from the Old Testament. But in reality, my uh, my wife and I came to understand Mary in, in two different ways. One for her was reading uh, St. Jerome's Treatise to Helveticus, and, and that was... Um, she read that where somebody had questioned Mary's ever virginity, and St. Jerome really blasted this guy. And my wife read that and said, oh, it's, this all makes sense. The Catholic Church is absolutely correct on Mary. For me, it was Cardinal Newman's book, The Two Eves. And I could I could go into, t- I don't have time to, but how the fact that, that Mary was viewed as the new Eve, another one of those types, um, explained it to me. But bottom line, Deacon, when I wrestled with the real issue for me was one of authority because I was one that held to the Bible alone. And once I understood that Jesus didn't leave a book when he went up to heaven, he left a living magisterium, and that living magisterium taught and practiced, that became the tradition, and then not until 400 years later was the book collected and put together. So I realized there was a church, and the church taught this and this and this about Mary, and I accepted the authority of the church. Therefore, all the doctrines of Mary fell right into place for me. Well, and I think that's, you know, you you touched on several points there, and I think that's what makes your work and what we're going to talk about here today so interesting is because uh, we're going to talk about the the birth of Mary, uh, which, again, nowhere found in in Scripture, and we rely uh, almost solely on tradition. But as you already mentioned, uh, her her birth is prophesied in the Old Testament. Touch on a couple of those, those moments. Yeah, the, the whole thing is always connected to where there's fun in Christ, but um, and, and one saint talks about the preparation of Mary in the Old Testament. They knew a woman was coming. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, and that's pretty darn early in human history, where he said to the devil, I'm going to, I'm going to put enmity between you, devil, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. So already in the Garden of Eden, we're set up for this great drama that's going to take place in the future where there's going to be a woman. And we know that this is going to be started, the war would be started with a woman that's going to show up in the future in, hi- in history. And I love, there's a, a St. Andrew of Crete, it's an island in the Mediterranean, and he says about Mary's birth and the preparation for it, all creation sings with joy and exults and participates in the joy of this day, on the day of her birth. This is the day on which the creator of the world constructed his temple. 
Just think of that. He's going to dwell in her. Therefore, she becomes the temple of God. And today is the day on which, by stupendous project, a creature becomes the preferred dwelling of the Creator. The Creator is actually going to dwell within one of His creatures. She becomes His temple. So this is the understanding of the Catholic Church of Mary being prepared all the way back from the book of Genesis to become the temple of the Creator. And, of course, her birth feast day in the Catholic Church is September 8th. We celebrate that. We're talking about it today because this is the month of Mary. But September 8th is uh, is her feast day of her birth. And nine months after that, guess what we get? We, the Immaculate Conception comes, I should say, nine months before that. The Immaculate Conception is when she's actually born, and she's born in this one stupendous way without sin. So Mary's birth divides, also another way to view this is it divides between the Old and the New Testament. Mary is not an Old Testament figure, nor is she really a New Testament figure. The New Testament comes with Christ dying and and raising again for us. Mary is kind of like the bridge in between the Old and the New Testament, and everybody was anticipating this to happen, but never realized how simple it would be, nor how stupendous it would be. In our last few minutes here with with Steve Rake, tell us a little bit then about what we believe or or, or where we believe she was born and and some of the events surrounding her birth. Okay, now one of the things that we have is a book, a a writing from the beginning of the second century called, it's a fancy title, but the Proto-Evangelium of James. It just means the first good news of James. And it was written in the first part of the second century, and it was highly regarded by the early Christians and and the Christians of the East even today. And in this, it, it tells about the birth of Mary. Now, it's not part of Scripture. It's not required. We believe it. But I think it has some very good information, and it certainly corresponds with what we have in, in the book of Luke. But that Mary... Her mother and father were uh, unable to bear children, and they both started to pray in their old age. And and Joachim and Anna, by the way, those names are not in the Bible. Joachim and Anna come from this book I'm talking about called the Proto-Evangelium of James. And, And Anna went out in her garden, and she was praying and praying, Why can't I have a child? Why can't you? Why won't you give me a child? And she looked up and saw a bird nest. And the baby birds are hatching. And she said, even the birds have children. Even the birds, you give them babies. But why not me? And the angel came and said, you'll have a child. And so she gave a pledge to God that she would dedicate this child to the temple. And, of course, we have, don't we, the devotion of the um, presentation of Mary in the temple. And this all comes from this document. People should read this document, really. It's not known very well, but it's a proto-evangelium of James. You can find it easily on the Internet. And the, the, the baby was born, and it says that, that, that she started walking, took steps at six months old, and that she, they took her to the temple, and she danced on the steps of the temple, and everyone loved her. And the women, holy women, carried her around. They said they never let her feet touch the ground. Well, why? What's wrong with that? Well, back in those days, you know, if you, I, I was raised on a farm deacon, and I know what the ground is like when there's animals all around. And this was in Jerusalem and places like that. Oh, my goodness, the, the streets would have been filthy. That's why they talk about washing feet so much in the Bible. So they carried her around, and then she was dedicated to the temple. But this was all prophesied of what was going to happen. Not not always real clear. It doesn't say there's going to be a girl. She's going to be named Mary and so on. But she got the name Mary from where? Well, it's really Miriam and it Miriam, and it is the sister of Moses. She was the great uh, prophetess, and when they d- defeated the Egyptians, she went and got the tambourine, and all the women danced. And the Catechism says that that um, uh, Miriam, along with several other women, prepared the way for the Blessed Virgin Mary. They kept the hope alive, and they prepared the way for her. They were her saints. So in Mary, she's growing up, this little girl. She had saints that she looked up to, like we have saints we look up to. And one of them was her namesake, Miriam. So the, the story, I, we, I know we don't have time to talk about it a lot, but the story of her uh, childhood and her growing up in the temple is really fantastic. Well, anyway, she would have lived in the temple until she was probably 12 years old. The menstrual cycle starts. She has to leave the temple for that reason. And then the family moves up to Nazareth, and then she meets 
Joseph around uh, when she's probably 15 years old, and then you know the rest of the, the story. Rest is, the rest is history, right? It's, uh, yeah. Well, she's been a, uh, we've been talking about vocations this morning. I know she has been uh, given birth to many vocations in the church. Uh, where can people find more uh, on your writings of, uh, of our Blessed Mother? Well, I'm, my website is catholicconvert.com, and if you go to resources, up on the top resources, I have hundreds of documents on all kinds of things, and I, I think I even have up there the Proto-Evangelium of James if people want to read it. Excellent, excellent. Well, he's uh, Steve Ray, thanks again so much for your generous time and your wealth of knowledge. You continue to strengthen my vocation. We'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Deacon. All right, God bless. Listen to the Catholic Morning Show weekday mornings at 7 on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, iowacatholicradio.com, or the Iowa Catholic Radio app.